Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. We can meet our destiny to build a land here that will be for all mankind a shining city on a hill. You're listening to the Liberty Brothers Radio Show, only on Revolution Radio. Now, here are your hosts, Jim White and Jason Van Tatenhove. Crusade for freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Please hang up and try again. Hello, Jim. We're trying to get Dane Wigington on the line. Dane, are you there? Yes, sir, Jim. All right, excellent, Dane. I don't know what happened the first time around, but, you know, that's... uh, that's Skype for you, and that's computers. Uh, thanks for joining us. You're live on the air here with uh, Jim and Jason from the Liberty Brothers. Glad to be with you both. Thanks for giving this issue a voice, which it desperately needs. Indeed, I'll tell you. Absolutely. Uh, let me give Dan, you. A... I got. Go ahead. I got... Before Jim starts, Dan, I want to just say it's an honor to meet you. Uh, when I first started waking up to the whole geoengineering, uh, your site was just invaluable as far as information and. Uh, I just I love the work you're doing, man. I just want to say thank you. Uh, same back to you, Jason. I, I appreciate what, what you two are doing. And again, without people like you, we wouldn't have a voice. It's all of us working together. All, we're all spokes in the wheel. Indeed. Absolutely. Well, well, Dane, let me give you a proper uh, let me give you a proper introduction. Joining us on the line is Dane Wigington. Dane has a background in solar energy. He is a former employee of Bechtel Power Corporation and has a background in renewable energy. His personal residence was a feature in a cover article on the world's largest renew- renewable energy magazine, Home Power. He owns a large wildlife preserve next to Lake Shasta in Northern California. I bet that's beautiful. Uh, Dane put all his focus, efforts, and energy on the geoengineering issue when he began to lose very significant amounts of solar uptake due to the ever-increasing solar obscuration caused from jet aircraft spraying in the skies above his forest home. He also noted significant decline in forest health was occurring and appearing to be accelerating. Extensive testing and research into the geoengineering issue was commenced and has continued since 2002. He is a lead researcher for hyperlink geoengineeringwatch.org and has investigated all levels of geoengineering from stratospheric aerosol geoengineering to HARP. He has appeared Uh, in numerous films and radio interviews to educate the public on the extremely dire environmental and health dangers we face on a global level from geoengineering. Dane lives in Shasta County, California. Dane Wigington, once again, thanks so much for joining us on the Liberty Brothers. And Jason is on uh, location, by the way, Dane. He's on the way down to cover that mine incident uh, out there in Oregon, so he may sound a little bit uh, distant because he's on his phone in the middle of nowhere. No worries. I had to do the same a lot of times myself. Dan, I got to say, uh, I, I noticed and uh, put up on our Twitter account and was just so inspired by the billboard outside of Helena, Montana, that was uh, one of your geoengineering watch billboards. And uh, apparently these are going up all across the country. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening with the billboard campaign? We have a number of people to thank for that. Uh, there's billboards in a number of locations. It's been a, a group effort, if you will, and uh, we're trying actually now to reach or we're communicating with some of the people who own the sign companies to try and make them understand that this is not our fight, it's their fight as well. And we actually have had one of the owners of the sign company put up a sign on his own at his own expense. So this is the goal, again, when reaching critical mass of awareness, people who in various professions realize they are going down with the rest of us. And then they began to march with us in this battle. And that's what we need to have happen. In fact, I I have a a conference call with several attorneys and a few other key people in regard to getting a suit going, uh, a legal action and and a, a location where we feel we can do the most good so these people are coming into the fray now because we've reached critical mass and we've had a lot of people that didn't uh, understand perhaps the importance of, of having that inertia.
But now that we're beginning to gain it, people in the sign industry, the legal industry, and a whole lot of other professions are, are going to now start joining our ranks. And that's what we need to have happen because climate engineering is not just another issue. And this is the point we tried to drive home, Jim and Jason. Yes, we face a lot of challenges, a lot of very, very dire challenges. But if you have one particular issue that is the biggest hole of all in the bottom of the boat, you have to, you have to deal with that. Climate engineering is that issue. And the threat and the immediacy of that threat is so profound. We simply have to deal with this now, not tomorrow. You know, Dane, I, I, I have friends of mine that are, that are good friends of mine that I consider uh, very knowledgeable. And uh, you know, trusted as far as uh, uh, you know their opinions, and they are still some of them on the fence about the whole geoengineering thing. And then you know, I look back at I want to say it was um, maybe it was Russia or China admitted that they uh, cleared up the weather for the Olympics or for some event. Uh, and they have uh, uh, um, you have a guy like Ben Livingston, who's who's uh, talked about. Uh, I guess considered the father of, of geoengineering or weather weapons, has talked about the ability way back in the late 60s to alter the weather. I mean, this is not anything new, is it, Dane? I know, I know people still are having a hard time grasping it, but this, is, this, is, this phenomenon has been around for some time, has it not? A, a, a very, very long time. In fact, going back to the 20s. So we know in the late 40s, the programs were ramped up to a significant scale, and there's a lot of data to corroborate that. So this is absolutely not new. It's historically documented. I mean, in, to a degree that can scarcely be imagined, the media, of course, has not talked about this. And we have a lot of people that want to remain in denial. So they simply don't do any investigation and hold on to their, their preconceptions, if you will. But the bottom line is few of us alive today, Jim, have known truly natural weather. The initial climate engineering programs, and this is important because a lot of people – even that are trying to fight the climate engineering battle, are, they, they give specific dates. Climate engineering started on this date or that date, and it's you know sometime in the last 15 years. This is not accurate, and we need to, people need to uh, do a little more investigation to understand just how far back these programs go. But what we see on the global temperature charts is a – fairly linear rise in temperature from 18, the 1850s when records were really kept in, in, uh, in some uniform fashion up to about the late 40s when the climate engineering programs really started in earnest. And then we see a very anomalous leveling off of that temperature rise. The, the initial geoengineering efforts had a much more profound effect. They were engineering over the poles. This is likely the, the greatest single causal factor of the ozone depletion in the northern and the southern hemispheres. The Again, the initial effect was much more profound until the negative aspects of climate engineering really began kicking in. So we saw leveling off of the temperatures from the late 40s to about the early 70s. And you, you may have heard people talk about the fact that by the early 70s, some of the climate science community couldn't figure out why the planet had leveled off in the temperatures and even had about 20% of the climate science community discussing maybe we're entering an ice age. They did not know climate engineering was going on. They did not calculate that effect in. But by the early 70s, the negative aspects of climate engineering really began to kick in. The temperature began to rise again in a very uh, rapid fashion. So what does the military industrial complex do? They just do more and more and more and more. And the more destruction it causes, the more they ramp up the programs to try to mitigate and hide the destruction already caused. So you can see this is the definition of insanity. Let me ask you this. What was the initial intent, do you think, when they first started this? Were they intending on trying to fix something and it just got way out of hand and now they're just trying to – they painted themselves into a corner and, and trying to just keep the pieces together – or was this something that was fairly insidious from the start? Well, ultimately, those in power don't do anything for the common good. So there is no benevolence in these programs. But all the above, everything you just stated, is, has some aspect in this equation. So the military-industrial complex and those in power knew that 
human activity was affecting the climate by the late 40s, their interest in mitigating anything is not for the common good. It's for their goal of keeping business as usual. So we had weather warfare as a major aspect of these programs, the ability to manipulate and control their own populations, and they felt, I believe at that time, data indicates they felt that they could play God with these with the climate systems with, with impunity, without consequence. And that's, that's what irrational, insane people think. So the, the more they intervened with these systems, the more damage they did. And of course, weather warfare is happening all over the globe. We know this. It's historically documented fact. Project Storm Fury, Project Popeye in Vietnam. We're not guessing on this stuff. So, and we have opposing powers also playing a tug of war with the atmosphere. And as this has gone on, and on and on. The climate system now has been completely derailed. It's long since been derailed. There is no, quote, natural weather. And now at this point, they're simply, I believe, frantic to try to hide the total cataclysm that they have helped to create as long as possible, again, while they're making provisions, while they're digging in and, and preparing for for total collapse. So, and one thing I stress too with the climate engineering programs, it's not just the climate modification aspect where they can decide where it rains, where it doesn't, uh, where it floods, where it doesn't. The materials we're breathing are highly toxic. Every breath we take is laden with these materials. And at any point in time, Jim and Jason, at any point in time when the power structure feels they're really losing control, why wouldn't we believe that they will change that mix, put something very lethal in it, and then it's game over for us. This is a very real possibility. I think people need to consider as well. And we've heard we've heard different uh, scenarios like that. Um, and I can tell you, I, I'm in good shape. I, I'm a fighter. I train to fight. I'm an amateur fighter, so I consider myself for being 41 in in pretty excellent shelf. My weakest link has been my lungs for the longest time. And I always attributed it to you know my parents smoking when I was a kid, this, that, and the other. But these days. I, I, I more and more feel like it, it has to be something that's happening in the air. And I can tell you, for, in Butte, Montana, I pay very close attention to what's happening in the skies. And we'll have two to three days of blue skies, and that's it. They will come and lay down a grid pattern, oftentimes with X's or straight-up squares. But a lot of times you see these X patterns. And within a matter of hours, we'll see this 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 haze come over, then cloud cover, this whitish kind of uh, semi-translucent cloud cover and a drop in temperature. And I try to document it in video all I can. Um, but is that part of it? Is it they, they don't want the blue skies happening? Are they try is that part of the agenda? Look, with solar radiation management, again, let me touch on this point for a moment. Semantics are extremely important. People should use the climate science terms. If you use the chemtrails term, that leads to a dead end, marginalization, conspiracy theory, hoax, so on. Use the science terms, climate engineering, geoengineering, solar radiation management. Solar radiation management, the express purpose is to block the sun, to deflect some of the sun's incoming thermal energy. Now, it doesn't take a scientist to figure out that when you are blocking the thermal energy on one side, you're also trapping it on the other side. So we know now that the climate engineering is creating an overall heating. They can create large scale temporary cool downs as they have done again and again and again on the eastern half of the US lower 48. But it comes at the cost of a worsened overall warming, a totally disrupted hydrological cycle, a decimated ozone layer and a completely contaminated planet. So the, the blocking out of the sun, again, this is part and parcel to the, the attempt to manipulate the climate system, and this is something that uh, they can't hide. They can't hide this. And so, again, we see the horizon to horizon trails on many days, and a lot of people mistake that for being the only time there's geoengineering going on. Anytime you see a trail behind these aircraft, unless you're in the northernmost latitudes in the coldest part of winter, you're seeing spray, period. We have film footage of these even the shorter trails being turned on and off. We know these are high bypass turbofan jet engines. By design, they're nearly incapable of leaving a condensation trail because 85% of the air that passes through them is non-combusted. I encourage people to look at the tutorial at the homepage of geoengineeringwatch.org. 
look at the tutorial, look at the animations, try to digest what those are, are teaching, and the fact that we shouldn't be seeing anything behind these aircraft. So again, the only way they can manipulate these air masses, change convection, migrate precipitation, you can't hide the particulates they disperse. It's just part of the programs. You know, Dane, you had an article, um, I believe, recently. Uh, you spoke to or emailed back and forth with a good friend of ours, Sean from SGT. He's going to be actually, I believe, um, on the show next week. We're trying to get him on the show next week, actually. Uh, we've been emailing back and forth. But, you know, uh, in, in the article that was, uh, I think, featured and picked up by Daily Sheeple today, as a matter of fact, you had a, it sounded like, uh, to me, from the article, that there's a spiritual aspect to this. And when I say spiritual aspect, I mean a Luciferian aspect to their side. Uh, do, you, do you see this, um, you know, I, I, I believe, quite frankly, that, that, you know, I really do believe that we battle against, uh, you know, uh, uh, spiritual wickedness in high places. Are you, are you getting that same feeling? It sounds like you are from the article that we are dealing with sort of an evil spirit. We've talked about that a lot on the show here. What say you about that, Dane? Well, I can certainly say that whatever makes these people tick, it's something very different than the rest of us. And when we see them at the Bohemian Grove in California, dancing around an effigy of Mulek, this some sort of demonic figure, I think it's safe to say that uh, that's what kind of people we're dealing with here. And, and uh, again, whatever motivates them it's something very dark and I, I don't think there's any disputing that so but but along with that I think it's imperative that we consider so many of the people the vast majority of the people involved with these programs are being lied to they're being told what they're doing is for the common good it's necessary even in fact I don't know if you guys know that there was a very disputed release from Edward Snowden it was "Quote unquote debunked," you know, his release about geoengineering and part of his documents. I believe his release was authentic because what he released is exactly what we would expect government documents to say. The documents said, if not for geoengineering, the climate would spin completely out of control within a year. Now, that's what the government says. That's what they're telling the military and others that are involved with these programs. Otherwise, these people, I believe, the majority would not participate. But they want to believe they're doing something good. So they, it gives a paycheck and a pension as well. So they choose to believe what they're being told. And they, quote, unquote, do their job. So we need they, to remember. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just going to say we need to remember there's a lot of compartment, compartmentalization going on. And that um, we, we need to break that down. We need to reach these people, especially our military brothers and sisters, so that they know there's a few dark people at the top, just like you described, Jim, that are orchestrating something that is profoundly lethal for all life. But let's talk about the infrastructure for a little bit, because they're, they're, in order for them to be spraying as much as they are on a global level, there has to be a massive... Uh, support structure involved with this. And, and really, we've never heard from pilots. We've heard from the supposed uh, pilot that released the, the Indigo Skyfold project, and, and, but never given a, a straight name, never really come out. Uh, hard to verify what he's saying. I mean, it, it sounds like it could possibly be true, but it sure seems there's just such a, a cloud of secrecy. I mean, there's got to be just thousands of people involved with a project of this, this size, um, how do you think they keep it so under wraps? Are these people living in fear? Are they, is it just like you say, they, they think they're doing good? Uh, I mean, they're breathing the same air we are. Their children are breathing the same air we are. And you know, at some point, they've got to come to the realization that, you know, it, it, it can't be good. Well, let's hope that point is soon. And I can... I know that people know. Like I've, I've communicated with plenty of people on the inside, even a NOAA scientist that have told me to my face, we know these programs are going on. We're alarmed as hell, and that's a direct quote, by the way. We don't know what to do. We have no First Amendment protection. So let's look at whistleblowers. Let's take John Kariaku, who blew the whistle in the financial industry. Who got put in jail? The whistleblower got put in jail. 
And now we're dealing with something that's much more dire, much more serious, and much more protected by the power structure. The aerosol, the global aerosol spraying issue is the greatest weapon the power structure has right now. It's what they will try to protect the most. We've had a number of scientists die recently, some NASA scientists, in fact, some that were of a a personality profile that might be the most likely to speak out have died very spectacularly. And is this not perhaps a shot across the bow of everyone else? We all know that every communication that we make is being monitored, no secret. So I would argue, yes, are those people involved who really know what's going on in these programs afraid to speak out? Absolutely. And even if they're not afraid for their own life, because I'm sure there's many that are brave enough to speak out and risk their own life, but it's their families. It's their families that I'm sure they're afraid of. So, again, compartmentalization, a lot of those, most of those participating don't really know the totality of what they're involved in. I spoke to a KC-135 pilot who did not know what he was doing up there. When he went back to ask questions, the final word I got on him was he was then medicated and put behind a desk. So, again, the scope and scale of this, yes, it's massive. And, and I, I had another conversation with a executive with Jeppesen. Jeppesen is a subsidiary of Boeing. They are the global flight coordinator in the world. I spoke to him face to face, 15 minutes of peripheral conversation. The moment I mentioned geoengineering, he turned his back and walked away. I know who this man is. He has kids. Simply people convince themselves that what they're doing needs to be done, or at least it's for their own personal benefit. There's a lot of reasons it keeps people in these programs, Jim and Jason. But the fear factor for those who really know, I would argue, is the bottom line factor, not just for them, but for their families. Wow. Just as a side note, I'm sitting here in in Idaho, just across the border in a mountain town, and literally have had uh, a a jet turn on their stream. uh, What appears to be four of them just right over my sunroof and coming over, and there's another one coming the other way. Just, It's amazing how much they're doing it, and that people still don't look up, don't Don't notice it. And there's an an, an intense, intense, um, you know, uh, agenda to discredit those of us who are talking about. I know that we've been attacked by a a scientist, supposed scientist named Ed Berry, who supposedly has been part of weather uh, engineering self-admittedly, but but just has attacked us time and time again. and, And, you know, because we're over target, I think. Um, that they, they, it seems to be there is an agenda to attack uh, those people who are talking about this. Oh, there is. And do me a favor next time. If you get communications that we can publish from someone like that who is using their quote-unquote official position or their expertise to lie and help to hide these programs, please send me those communications. We'll I will send up. you links tonight. Okay. If I, yeah. Super because easy. I own it up. I, I have another website called the Disinformation Directory. Just It's disinformationdirectory.com. And we feature these kinds of people on that site. We do a profile on them. We post their lies. We post their official email contacts, and we put them out for the, for the public to rattle their cage so that they know we know what they're doing, so that they know that once this is out in the open, the public is going to hold them responsible for their part in this crime. And believe me, that sends a chill down their back because they know they're lying. Whatever motivates them, we can speculate about, but they know they're lying in almost all cases. And when we expose them on the disinformation directory, they typically shut up and and stop spewing their lies. So if you forward that to me, we'll pass it on to the disinformation directory and we'll feature such people on that site. It's edberry.com, but I will forward you the specific link talking about our articles and our interviews please please that's the purpose of that so these people again what we're trying to do right now i just recently saw we've tried to expose a meteorologist in northern california he works for channel 7 news mainstream his, his name is mike kruger and he has adamantly told their news people not to touch this issue. He won't talk about it. So we're trying to expose him. And I recently saw on his Facebook page, to go back to our earlier discussion, someone sent me who's communicating with him on his personal page, a message from him pleading with them not to bring up this issue. He had a six-year-old boy. Uh, he, he felt he was being watched. That's what we face. They all self-censor at this point. And another 
encounter with a Fox News meteorologist who told us he was taken into the room and told, you do not touch this issue. A Duke scientist who I know, the lab manager at Duke University, double PhD, told me she's been taken into a room twice now and told you don't talk about this issue or there'll be consequences. What does that mean? Uh, everybody's trying to protect themselves. It's understandable given people's families and so forth, but we have to come out in mass. We have to deal with this issue or the ship will go down. And I mean soon. You know, Dane, we see, we see the, uh, we see uh, companies like uh, Monsanto. Uh, I believe they're behind it. When you have the, uh, the, you have the seed vault that they, they, they put all these seeds in the seed vault. You're probably familiar with that. It's um, called the, the doomsday seed vault. Yes. Correct. Thank you. Um, you know, it was my, you know, you please comment on this. It was my supposition that, uh, you know, some of the spraying that they're doing is really going to, you know, uh, really basically ruin, ruin the soil perhaps, and, uh, maybe do some serious damage to the ecology of our, of our, of our, uh, you know, of our plant life and our growing life. I mean, is it, is it, this stuff's got to fall down to the ground and get into the soil, correct? And it's got to get into the food we eat. Is that, is that accurate? It has, and it comes down very quickly. Uh, when you look at geoengineers like David Keith, who I had a confrontation with that many have seen at an international conference, when he states that this material stays in the stratosphere for two years, that's a blatant lie. And our communications with polymer chemists – we believe the descent times for some of these materials can be under the right conditions as fast as 12 to 24 hours. It comes down very quickly. So the soils are already horrifically damaged. The planet is horrifically damaged. The ozone layer is horrifically damaged. But there are much bigger wheels turning than Monsanto. Monsanto is simply a buzzard feasting on the carrion. They're, they're a disaster capitalist. The bottom line is now... The planet's climate system has been horrifically damaged, and we have climate feedback loops that have been triggered. I talk about methane a lot because it's the single greatest feedback loop that has now been triggered. There's pr as many as 40 to 50 feedback loops, but methane is flooding the atmosphere right now. They are trying desperately to hide this fact as long as possible. In fact, some of the methane released from the seafloor, this is frozen methane hydrate deposits on the seafloor and there are immense deposits in the Arctic. Some of those releases are so powerful at this point that it's breaking up some of the multi-year sea, uh, sea ice. And so this is something that they can't hide much longer. And I would argue we start to weave this in with the uh, Jade Helm exercises and a lot of other things that are being used right now to keep the population calm till the last moment. The stock market's being completely artificially inflated. It's always been artificial, but now it's at levels that, that, that absolutely boggle the mind. They're, doing, they're playing every card they can to keep the normalcy bias going as long as they can so they can make whatever provisions they're making until total collapse ensues. And I don't care how much money you print – I don't care how much you want to fake figures about unemployment or anything else. When the biosphere stops producing, and, and by the way, nature produces 75% of all global GDP for free, but not anymore. When you can't hide that anymore, you can't, you can't fix that with fake figures or printing. When, the, when you can't catch fish out of the sea, and right now global pelagic fish populations are down 90 to 95%, the oceans are crashing, crops are crashing, you can't hide that for very long. And once the public understands the gravity and immediacy of what they face, our paradigm will change on that day. Well, we're already seeing it in California. I mean, California truly has become a sacrificial zone. We've never seen weather patterns like this. And when we have 70 percent of our produce coming from that area, now they're they're using smart meters to be uh, making sure you don't use too much water. Obviously, the weather has been severely manipulated there, and you got to wonder what could their reasoning possibly be other than to cause great damage because so much of our food's coming from there. Well, again, this is where I talk about California a lot, of course, because it's it has such focus on it right now, and what's being done here is so incredibly cataclysmic. But I think we should look at California in two categories. It's a climate sacrifice zone. The engineered cooldowns that they have repeated over and over and over 
in the eastern half of the U.S. lower 48. The only way they can accomplish that is to push the jet stream north through Alaska. Alaska's had a lot of record warm temperatures. They have the blocking ridge, the quote, ridiculously resilient ridge over California. So that pushes the jet stream north, then they push it back south, and they can manipulate it, by the way, for those who doubt that, you need to educate yourself on the ionosphere heaters, uh, the heart facilities around the globe. So California is a climate sacrifice zone in one sense, but many things are always going on at once. There's, there's no benevolence in these programs, so at the same time, yes, they're cutting off the water, even water that does moisture over or migrate over California, they aerosolize it. They Aerosolizing means too many condensation nuclei, too many tiny particles. So the water droplets can't combine and fall as rain. They continue to migrate. So they can migrate that moisture right over the top of us. That's what they're doing. So that allows them then to clamp down on populations, take water rights. This is the noose around our neck, if you will. So California is, again, a target, a climate sacrifice zone. This ridiculously real, resilient ridge of high pressure also, Jason and Jim, again, it helps them cool the East Coast. It also pushes the trade winds backwards. The El Nino should have developed several times since 2007. In fact, spring of 2014 was the strongest Kelvin wave ever recorded, the strongest buildup to El Nino ever recorded, and it didn't develop. And the climate science community were scratching their heads. Why didn't the wind patterns respond? They didn't respond because the geoengineers didn't want them to respond. They want to keep bottling that heat up in the ocean so that it masks the overall damage that's been done to the planet. So back to the California scenario, there are many aspects of this. Climate sacrifice zone, target, uh, acquisition of water rights. People have to be careful to try to put it in this or that equation. It's, there's many things going on at once, always. Well, you know, Dave, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Jason. No, go ahead, Jim. I'm sorry, I've been hogging. No, it's all good. It's all good. Um, you know, Dane. It's uh, my my question is, what is the what you know what is what, what is the end game? And I, I'm going to bring this up. And it sounds to me like, of course, you're you're an, a, a geoengineering expert, but it sounds to me like you have a, a a wide range of knowledge about the other things. If I would if I would make comments about the New World Order, the Illuminati, and that type of stuff, these would not be foreign terms to you. I I assume is that correct? Not at all. Right on. Um, so what do you think is the you, – you've heard reports before uh, about a global population, uh, um, uh, depopulation, I should say. You know, you've got the Georgia Guidestones. You've got idiots like Ted Turner coming out making comments. Do you see that as part of what they're doing here at the geoengineering? Is that just one part of the, of the overall end game puzzle of eliminating part of the population or you're not prepared to, to go down that road? I'll go down that road. It's it's eugenics. I think it'd be impossible to argue that it's that it's not a part of this equation. It is a part. It is a part of the equation, but it's just a part of the equation. And it, and back to the complexity of this, the power structure certainly has had plans that they have been laying out for a very long time. In fact, especially in regard to the aerosol spraying, the the climate engineering, I believe that for Several decades, they felt they could manipulate the climate indefinitely. And as, as I alluded to in the beginning of this conversation, they initially had what they would have considered success. They absolutely slowed the rate of warming considerably. And I believe in their arrogance and insanity, they felt, as psychopathic people do, that they could continue this indefinitely without consequence. Now, I believe the power structure is fraying apart, panicked. They know they've let Pandora out of the box. There's no putting it back. And now it's simply damage control. Now they're trying to confuse and divide the populations while they are making preparations for all hell to break loose. So at this point, I would argue that's the biggest part of the climate engineering equation. And, and the benefits of that as well, again, we're all getting dumber by the day. We're breathing this stuff in. It's affecting our cognitive ability. It's affecting our health. All these are benefits to those in power. And when people, so many people, as you guys I'm sure have heard, said to your face, uh, why would they do this if they do it to themselves as well? We have too many examples of what they do to themselves. Too many. The detonation of 2,000 nuclear bombs, 
nuclear power plants, any one of which could end life on Earth, and maybe Fukushima will. Uh, there's no sanity in this equation in that regard. And we know that there are facilities to chelate the human body. There's one in Germany. I've spoken to researchers that have actually been there and been treated. It's not available to you or me. But the blood is pulled from the body and cleansed. It's a two-day process. If they did this once a year, it would likely exempt them from most of the consequences. So, again, two factors. They have methods of keeping themselves healthier than the rest of us do, and we're not dealing with sanity. And, and both of those are factors in this equation. So the, the overall picture right now, as far as the why, it started with power and control, and it, that's the biggest aspect over many decades, but now we're at a point where a large part of what they're doing is simply trying to hide the full damage that's been done to the planet, to divide the population, again, the engineered cool down of the eastern U.S. is simply to divide the population. It's a, it's a psychological operation. People who live there think it can't be warm anywhere. So everybody's fighting about whether it's warming or cooling. That's the most anomalously cold place on the entire planet for two years, completely engineered. So it's a psychological operation in that sense. But all of these things designed to hide the gravity of what's unfolding till the last possible minute. So, Dane, what, what, what's the $5 million question is, what is it going to look like when this this does finally unfold and this crash happens? They can't hide it anymore. What does that look like to us? Well, that's a hard one to answer because we're in uncharted water, truly in uncharted water. The, the reality we have known will crash. And that I, I would I base that on math. On this current trajectory right now, uh, we we cannot continue much longer. There's no question about that. And there are many things they can't hide much longer. And, and when they can't hide it, that makes the power structure much more dangerous. If we talk about the planet as a whole, what happens if we stay on this current trajectory? Mathematically speaking, the planet won't support life much longer. Some of the best people on the frontline research, the best scientists right now, their math, which I believe is as accurate as any we have, would state that on this trajectory, if we do not change course completely, we're mathematically looking at a planet that won't support life past 2040, and the northern hemisphere likely much earlier than that. The bottom line is we have to change course immensely. The, the human race has done tremendous damage to the planet. We've been very poor stewards of the planet in too many ways to even name, but the, the epitome, the epitome of human insanity is climate engineering. So the, the, from the economic end, to the environmental end, all of these are converging at once, James and Jason, all at once. So it's anybody's guess as to which link will fall out of the chain first, but I would argue they know some links are going to start falling out soon. That's why we have exercises like Jade Helm about to fire up. Well, you know, uh, we've talked about Jade Helm quite a bit, and we can certainly talk about that. Um, you know, we, we're going to have you here for two hours. We can discuss those issues. Uh, absolutely, Dane. Um, I, 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 I want to flesh out this, uh, the, geo, uh, the geoengineering a little bit more first, though. I, I, you know, and I know it's Hollywood, but I want to say the movie the, the Matrix, I believe. And I think Jason pointed this out yesterday the day before. I think the premise of that movie was they said, you know, we set the sky on fire, basically, is what we did. We we set the whole sky on fire or something. Yeah, we something darkened of that the nature. skies. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you see us? I, I, I know it's Hollywood, Dane. I know it's Hollywood. But, I mean, with everything they're spraying in the air, it's got to be – some of it has to be combustible, one would think. I mean, do we have – the, the real possibility of, quote-unquote, setting the sky on fire in that sense? I mean, I know we're doing a lot of damage, but could it get that bad? Along that scenario, Holly's Woods painted a number of scenarios. You have the day after tomorrow scenario where the Atlantic conveyor shuts down. And, you know, that scenario is, is not a, a realistic scenario, even if the conveyor did shut down. But in regard to this sort of scenario you mentioned, Jim, we have CH4, methane hydrate releasing in very significant quantities right now in the Arctic. It also comes from fracking and a lot of other sources, but the, the reserves, the reservoirs in the Arctic are, are massive. We have also CS2, hydrogen sulfide, is also releasing at the same time. And we have had a number of occurrences already where the rotten egg smell along the coasts, very big red flag, happened in 
Seattle. I had reports from several other places along the U.S. West Coast of this, this smell remaining for several days. The fish kills also go along with this. So as this material releases, these gas releases from the seabed, hydrogen sulfide and methane, that deoxygenates the water. And that's what's killing those fish so quickly. It's not Fukushima. I'm not saying Fukushima isn't bad or the fish aren't radioactive. They are. But that radioactivity does doesn't cause the kind of fish kills that we have seen. So hydrogen sulfide is heavier than air. Methane is lighter than air. Methane goes up in the atmosphere, hydrogen sulfide stays down. It's very flammable. So if big enough pockets of hydrogen sulfide accumulated, can that be ignited? Can that quote unquote light the sky on fire? Yes, it can. If, if enough quantity I- accumulated. I think that was the road, Jim, that actually the atmosphere ignited and then caused oh, is that a what cataclysmic, it was? Okay. Yeah, cataclysmic uh, loss of life. But yeah, I believe it was that, t- that scenario they were talking about. Without ignition, hydrogen sulfide is very deadly, even in smaller quantities. So the authorities will do everything they can to hide this. And now what, what are our, quote, experts or our agencies, their job is to hide everything, to lie about everything. This is absolutely their job. And I've been in high-level meetings. I've, I've met with the lieutenant governor in the capital of uh, the California state capital. I've had high-level EPA meetings. I've spoken in front of the California Energy Commission. I've spoken in front of CARB, California Air Resources Board. I've been in Boxer's office. These people, all of them, are part of the cancer. And their job is to lie, to hide everything from the public. So when we have this, this rotten egg smell, the hydrogen sulfide, the authorities, of course, never know what it could be. The fish kills, they never know. If there's too much radiation, they just raise the radiation levels 10,000%. In fact, after Fukushima, the safe radiation levels were raised 10,000% in certain locations. That's, that's what kind of world we live in. You just simply hide the problem by changing the level of the bar. So, you know, people need to understand these agencies are not there for their protection. They're there to hide the problem. We're coming up on uh, the, the first uh, break here. Uh, I'd like to, in second hour, maybe talk about uh, the history of, of the HARP project and how it's evolved into NEXRAD and then into uh, the now Space Fence and how that ties in. Yeah, we can go into the ionosphere heaters. And, and again, this is a huge aspect. It's part of how they maneuver these particulates around the atmosphere, how they create stronger high pressure domes. When you have an atmosphere full of these particulates and you microwave them, which is basically what they're doing, and those, those particles, the friction and the movement, they can create heat. We've seen this over the, inside the high pressure domes where the UV radiation actually goes up with an atmosphere full of particulates, not down. And also, if you aerosolize the moisture and you hit it with specific frequencies, you can cause those particulates to repel each other and scatter, which scatters the rain, migrates the moisture. With frequencies that are more designed to bring those particulates together and coagulate, you can cause a big enough condensation nuclei then to have that rain fall. So in the combination of use with aerosolizing the atmosphere and the use of the ionosphere heaters, the radio frequency transmitters, of which there are several dozen large ground-based facilities around the globe, that allows them to, again, create the high-pressure zones, migrate the moisture, cause it to fall in certain regions. And, you know, again, if we want to take this all the way down the rabbit hole, the ionosphere heaters appear to be able to create seismic activity under the right circumstances as well. I'm sure you guys know that. Yes, yes, we've had people on that have talked about that as well. Uh, I'd say here, coming to the end of the first hour, Dane, this would be a great opportunity for you to give out your website again, uh, any Facebook page, YouTube channel, uh, anything like that, uh, Twitter account, any way that people can find out more about you. Uh, you can take us out till the music comes on. Go right ahead. Uh, I, my, I do have three Facebook pages under my name and under Geoengineering Watch. And geoengineeringwatch.org is our website. We are non-political. We do not sell anything. Our only goal is to sound the alarm on this issue. So people can, can find flyers they can download there for free that they can print and use in their area. Again, our only goal, Jim and Jason, is to get the word out. Well, you, plus you have, a, I mean, you have a copious amount of YouTube videos as well. I'm not sure if you have, 
your own specific YouTube channel or people just pick up uh, your your stuff and put it out. But uh, I know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there uh, with you on it. Is it not is that not true, Jane? It is true. I, I do have a YouTube channel and presentations to educate others. On the homepage of geoengineeringwatch.org, you can find very, very data-filled presentations. Uh, there's a number of them on the homepage. You can find presentation of experts there. Um, and again, people can utilize the data off our site and, and recopy it, repost it. It's there for that purpose. So there's a number of uh, very hard-hitting presentations there available, and uh, people, again, they're free to copy it, download it, make DVDs, share it, whatever. We just want to get the data out. Well, that's great, Dane. I'll tell you, uh, real quick, and, and literally any second here, the music's going to come on. Um, oh, there it is right there. Okay. Um, well, that's the end of the first hour here for the Liberty Brothers Radio Show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Jason, of course, is on location, heading towards uh, uh, heading out west. And we have Dane Wigington on the line. Please join us after the break and uh, on the Liberty Brothers Radio Show. Thank you. All right, folks, we're back. I think we missed the uh, end of the music there real quick. Sorry about that. We were engrossed in conversation off server. This is, of course, the Liberty Brothers radio show. We're coming to you live. Well, mostly out of the state of great state of Montana. I'm actually in Idaho right now, heading over to Oregon. As always, in hour two, we want to encourage our listeners to do their part to help support the networks that carry us. Revolution Radio, our home network, is the largest listener-supported internet radio station in the world, and that takes some doing. So, um, if you love what you get here, you get 24-7, 365 days a week of two studios of talk radio, everything from the paranormal to Agenda 21 to, to shows like the Liberty Brothers. And if you love it, please do your part by voting with your wallet. Right now, Hawk is doing a great spring special uh, through the month of April. Uh, if you donate $100 you'll get a heirloom seed vault, which is uh, just absolutely essential for uh, the, your prepping supplies. Along with that, he's also going to send you a troy ounce of silver. Now, that's only in the continental United States. You can't ship it elsewhere, unfortunately. But uh, please do do your part there. We want to say thank you to our sponsors, lulzbot.com. Makers of the Lulzbot Mini, which is uh, pretty much the highest reviewed 3D printer out there. If you have ever thought of getting, getting, getting into 3D printing, this is literally plug and play. 15 minutes out of the box, you can have it set up, running, and uh, just incredible. If you want to see the reviews, go to our friend over at naturalnews.com, Mike Adams. He's got It's the editor's choice over there, and he's got a great write-up on it. Also want to thank MSI Tactical for their sponsorship. That's MSI-Tactical.com. Want to give a shout out to our listeners on Red State Talk Radio, WDFP, and the other terrestrial stations that are carrying this. If you're hearing some uh, commercials on our show, be sure to let the no those, those sponsors know you heard about them on the Liberty Brothers Radio Show. All right. Well, we're back, and we're talking about geoengineering. And... Um, and I wanted to, to ask you, have we come to a point of no return? Have, have we reached the Rubicon? Are we able to fix this yet? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Jason, we're with Dane, we're with Dane Wigington. Um, I just want to make an introduction uh, before we started firing questions. We just, we're joined again by Dane Wigington from geoengineeringwatch.org. Sorry, proceed. Oh, sorry. No worries, guys. It's uh, to answer your question, Jason. Um, no, we're not coming to a point of no return. We're far past the point of no return. We will never know the planet that we have previously known. There is far too much inertia in the equation. I realize a lot of people, because they don't want to believe that, will accuse me of of being an alarmist. I'm simply a realist. This is reality. It's a mathematical fact. Now we're fighting to save a planet that may preserve life still. That's how dire our situation is. People have been trained to believe a lot of things, that such changes only take place over great spans of time, millennia. 
This is not the case. Even without human activity, massive climate changes have taken place in a short period. Now we have a factor in the equation that has never been there before. So we've seen the changes we have seen happen in such an incredibly short period of time should have people completely alarmed. They're right now in a, in a state of coma with their iPhones and their, their reality shows on TV. That reality is going to be blown apart very, very soon. So few are paying attention and I hope that changes. We're seeing forests die off around the globe. We, have, we are in today, right now, mathematically, we're in the sixth great mass extinction on planet Earth. We've been, at, we've been losing about 200 species of plant and animal a day for a long period of time. Now the latest figures are pushing toward 300 a day. And those who say this is normal, and you, you can find people who say it's normal, that species have always gone extinct. This is from 10 to 15,000 times normal background rates. There's nothing normal about this. I mean, this is the ludicrousness of some people's arguments, you know, that they, they claim that this is all natural. Uh, people die. That's natural. But if you shoot somebody in the back of the head, you kind of speeded up the process a bit, didn't you? And, and this is the sort of equation we face. So right now, it's a mathematical certainty that we are far past the point of return. There is, we're in a Thelma and Louise moment. We're through the guardrail. Putting the brakes on now doesn't really matter. We're going to the bottom of the canyon. Now, if we stop interfering with the planet's life support systems, which the greatest single factor is climate engineering, that's our best potential. That's our best leap forward, but that's how dire our situation is right now. And again, that species extinction rate should shock people if they're halfway awake. Well, you know, the the ocean plays such a such a huge part in our our everyday life. And I I submit to you that if the ocean dies, we die probably pretty quickly after. And I no think you you actually had a, an article too about the dying trees, and I think it was something to that effect too. And in your article, something about once the trees die, we die, or something of that nature. Uh, exactly. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have that right. It's exactly what I said. You're right. Uh, okay. Talk a little bit back to the oceans. We can talk about the trees afterwards, and I'd be interested to know about the bees as well, the bee population, if, if geoengineering has anything to do with that. But Donald, uh, Donald Canfield, uh, he's a geologist, uh, published a, uh, uh, a paper and talked about the Canfield Ocean model or the, the Canfield ocean effect. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, that's the track we're on right now. Once these gases start releasing from the seafloor, the ocean acidifies and becomes hypoxic or anoxic, uh, and low oxygen or no oxygen. This is happening right now. We have 400 plus dead zones around the planet in the ocean, some as big as 10,000 square miles that are hypoxic or anoxic zones. Nothing lives. We're seeing the, the tipping of the ecosystem in the ocean now. It's, it's absolutely horrific. You guys, I'm sure, heard of the starfish, starfish wasting the seal die off of 10 to 15,000 seals washing up on California shores dead. You heard about that, I assume? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. So we also have in the, once the chemistry of the ocean starts to change, and it's 30% more acidic now than it was at the start of the Industrial Revolution. That's a huge change. So we're seeing now the ecosystem tilt out of balance. For example, jellyfish can survive in hypoxic zones. So we're seeing a massive global proliferation of jellyfish off the coast of Japan and China. There's a species of jellyfish that's nine feet across the back when fully mature. They're huge. The Japanese, even though their fish are radioactive and there's not very many of them, they can't even catch those because the nets fill with these jellyfish that are extremely heavy, breaks the nets. So then when man fights back against nature, as the Japanese fishermen tried to do, and as the whole human race is trying to do, and, and again, a, a battle against nature is a battle against yourself, but they tried to make steel nets to sift these jellyfish, to cut them apart, if you will. That's exactly what causes the jellyfish to reproduce. 
It causes their egg release. So it made their problems 10 times worse still. So again, from every direction, when man tries to fight back against nature, uh, it, it can only go poorly. And that's what we see happening. And, and the, the, the more uh, tenaciously man struggles, the, the worse the battle gets. So on the Canfield Ocean, again, if the ocean dies, we die. And back to climate engineering and climate engineering's effect on that or impact on that, again, it's changing wind currents, that's altering ocean currents, it's causing the ocean to stratify, to layer, and that radically changes the, the chemistry of the ocean. It's releasing these gases from the seabed I talked about, and climate engineering, as I mentioned earlier, of course, is shredding the ozone layer. Now we have extremely intense UV radiation, and we're metering this, we're not guessing, and this is the degree to which the power structure and the quote-unquote agencies and authorities can hide things from the public. We're seeing UVB radiation in the places we're metering it a thousand percent higher than we're being told. It's so powerful, it's burning the bark off of trees. So back to the ocean, that intense UV is killing plankton. Now we see global plankton stocks are down 50 to 60%. Plankton produces 50% of the Earth's oxygen supply. It's a single greatest producer of Earth's oxygen. So from every direction, you can tie horrible things to climate engineering, from contaminating the air we breathe, destroying the Earth's protective layers of the atmosphere, disrupting the hydrological cycle, contaminating the entire planet, uh, this is why I've focused on this issue. Again, we face a lot of challenges. They're all important in and of themselves. But I again argue, if the house is burning to the ground, uh, there's not much point in, in painting the eave, if you will. You have to put the house out. Well, Dane, let, let's go back in history a little bit. What brought you... What, what, what made you aware? What was your awakening moment? What first started you down this path? Well, thanks for asking. This, this, this is not a job I wanted. I'm not an activist. I'm not politically oriented at all. I moved to the Pacific Northwest. Again, as you guys know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. You mentioned that I'm off grid. I grew up in a very, very smoggy, polluted Southern California as a as a small boy, I wondered why the adults weren't alarmed because I was very alarmed. All I could think about was moving out of there. So when I expected to find clean air here, have a large off-grid solar home, and I was losing on some days 60, 70, 80% of my solar power uptake from whatever these aircraft were leaving behind. Certainly something was wrong. And I was shocked when I started to research and found mountains of data on geoengineering describing exactly what I saw in the sky. I started to take tests at the state certified lab of the precipitation based, and I searched for the elements that were named in the climate engineering patents, starting with aluminum and barium. I did not want to find these metals. I wanted something to convince me this wasn't happening, but I did find these metals. I found in the initial lab test, which we considered a baseline, seven parts per billion of aluminum, which is already high given the location I live in. I spoke to a hydrogeologist. It's the first thing I did when I had that test. Subsequent tests, Jim and Jason, had aluminum as high as 3,450 parts per billion in a single rain test. These are astoundingly high levels. And quite simply, I was faced with a, a fight that I never wanted, but if you can't breathe, and I, I ask anybody listening, if you can't walk out your door and breathe without sucking in a lungful of heavy metal, if your children are breathing this, if it's killing everything on which your future depends, how can you not engage in this battle? No, you have to, Dane. Uh, you know, you, you, you know, I have two children. Uh, and I, you know, and that's really one of the whole reasons. Not that I, the question was asked to me, but I'll answer it. Um, that is for me one of the reasons that I got involved in this uh, this whole thing here. You know, with the whole alternative media and doing a news program and a, and a radio program, and I guess close to three hundred YouTube videos now I've produced. 
I, I look down at you know at my children's faces, and I, I think to the, you know, if everything goes south and the balloon goes up, and they look at you know they look at me and say, "What did you do to try to stop this?" I you know I want to be able to say I did everything I could, you know I, I did everything that I could to try to stop this, and you know you know some days Dane I think that there's a good chance we are going to stop it, and then some days I think. Man, we're just on a fast track to disaster. Uh, do do you vacillate between those two, or are you do you realize that we're, as you said, well past that point now? Well, we're we're past the point of return to the reality we've known, and the reality we've known was never sustainable. What a total illusion that you can perpetually expand on a finite planet with finite resources. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of thought to realize that's not possible. So yes, I, I have days when uh, the climb feels very arduous and, and at times futile, but one, it's not futile in that for, for every single person we help to wake up, you, Jason, me, and everybody else involved in the fight for the common good, for every person we help to wake up, the battle absolutely matters. No question about that. And if, if we look at the, those that aren't engaging, those that convince themselves they can't do anything, they can't make a difference, that's an absolute lie. Any person listening, any one of your audience could be the last grain of sand to tilt the scale, the last pebble to cause the landslide. Any one of them could be. We have immense power if we would simply use it. And we are not allowed... We are not allowed to sit the bench and do nothing. I don't care what, whatever spiritual belief people hold, there are none of the great traditions that allow you to sit and do nothing. You're required to engage. And, and I'm sorry to say that some of the most apathetic, and I, I don't blame any particular tradition, but rather the men who claim to be representing those traditions, pastors and churches, with whom I've met, I've met many of these people and tried to pass on data. And I've been told more times than I can remember, it's all in big hands. We don't want your data. We're not worried about this. No, brother, the brother, that's a whole wow. other, that's a whole other show. <laughs> Let me tell you, we, we, we've talked about the, our disappointment with the, the, uh, the, the, the pastoral uh, profession. Yes. Is, yes. is is just it's 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 miserable to say the least. I mean, I'm nope. being I'm being generous. And no reflection at all on the validity of those traditions, but only those who claim to represent them. And I've never left with that statement. I have always shamed these men into taking that data and pointing out to them that that, that scripture says their their own the parable of the talents and, and another scripture makes clear that you don't have that option. You're required to be a good steward, to, to not turn, turn a blind eye to what you know is wrong. You're required to do that. And what, what's keeping them from doing this? They're more worried about their nonprofit status than anything else. And now let's move on to the environmental, the quote-unquote environmental groups. I just took a trip up the California coast, observational trip, to see how bad the die-off was of Sitka spruce, uh, Tory Pine. The die-off is horrific on Highway 1. It's it's completely horrific. There are whole groves of dead trees. There's excavators tearing them out. You have official agencies, and again, I know scientists with USDA, uh, USFS, Forest Service, Park Service. I, I know a lot of these people, and their job is to deny that anything's wrong. And yet we have, again, huge crews tearing out massive groves of trees around million-dollar homes, and nobody seems to know a damn thing. And why is that, again? Everybody is, is lying for a paycheck and a pension, and nobody more so in denial than the quote-unquote environmental groups. And I met with a number of them in Arcata and Eureka only a week ago, and I mean f frustration that I have seldom felt to that degree, looking at a, quote, environmentalist with a, a supposed eco newspaper telling me he's really not that interested 
to which I, I confront that hypocrisy. I can't walk out like that. How can you, sir, call yourself an environmentalist when you're ignoring the single greatest threat to the planet of all? Hypocrisy D- is beyond belief. Dane, do you think that the, the uh, I, I came from Colorado and now in Montana, this supposed uh, Japanese beetle kill off of the pine trees, it, it, is that just an excuse? Is there is there is that tied into the geoengineering, those die offs? I mean, it's massive. We've seen massive fires uh, in the town I lived in. The fire came almost up to town but just thousands and thousands of acres, but it's all being blamed on the uh, Japanese pine beetle. I I wonder if that might be just a convenient excuse. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. It's only a symptom. Again, it it would be like shooting someone and and not even mentioning the bullet, just saying they, they just bled to death. We don't know why. That's exactly how it is. What, here's what you have. You have forests, that are being exposed to bioavailable toxic heavy metals. In the case of aluminum, we have peer-reviewed study. We know the effect on the root system. It causes those organisms to shut down nutrient uptake. They starve to death slowly, even if they have water. It sterilizes the soils, sterilizes the soil microbes. It coats the foliage. And these materials can be uptaken through the tree's stomata their respiratory ports. So they're uptaking these metals through the foliage as well. The metals are an incendiary dust. It coats the foliage with an incendiary. You have unbelievably intense UV that is frying the trees from the top down. They're dropping their foliage. They're letting go of branches. They're trying to reduce their overall exposure to this UV. Total disruption of the hydrological cycle. Total disruption. You also have, so you have much less rain in many places and it's much more sporadic and much hotter in between those rain periods. Now, you also, these materials are desiccants. They absorb all of available moisture. How much dew do you guys see anymore? Do you notice you don't see dew much anymore? We don't on the West Coast. It dries the atmosphere out. So from every direction, the beetles are only a symptom of a forest that's been horrifically compromised. And those agencies, again, their job is to find some other excuse for what happened. You know, this is about like 9-11, right? Building seven, it came down because some couches and chairs were burning on the first floor, really? That's the kind of lie we face with the climate engineering issue, same thing. Well, there's a whole other show again, Dane, I'll tell you, brother. (laughs) Um, I'm, I'm it, from New Jer- Jersey, New York. <laughs> I remember watching. I was watching the newscast when they said Building 7 went down. I knew what Building 7 was. It was right in the background, and it didn't go down until later. And then they suppressed that. I saw it with my own eyes. I, my brother was yeah. two blocks away when those buildings went down. Dane, let me ask you this. Y- you talked about how people are, are in this stupor with their iPads and their iPhones and just... They don't seem to get it. I think part of the issue, though, is 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 part of what's being sprayed. We're being so inundated with aluminum loom byproducts. You look at the fluoride; it's in the water. It, it's a byproduct of the aluminum smelting process. You look at the Prozac everybody's on. Again, a product of aluminum. Then they're spraying it into the air, and we've seen what this does to our own brains. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what? aluminum barium does to our our nervous system and our brain? Uh, Nothing good. I mean, we have plenty of peer-reviewed study on that. And we know each of these metals is highly toxic in and of themselves. You know, again, barium, aluminum, we've detected now lead, which has been named in ice nucleating patents, copper, manganese. We have... Also now, synergistic toxicity. So each of these metals, again, toxic in and of themselves. You blend them together. The overall toxicity increases radically. We do have study in the case of aluminum and mercury. We all have mercury in us, not just from feelings or vaccinations, but from the air we breathe. The coal power plants put out a lot of mercury, and we've all 
absorbed a lot of mercury. So all these metals are mixed. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Is that a question? I thought no, I, I, think, I think it was like a, something in Skype made a noise or something. You're okay. good. Go ahead. So, so all these metals are combining in our system. They're, they're bioaccumulative, so they're building up in our system. And certain metals also affect aluminum's ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So we know fluoride can make it easier for aluminum to cross the blood-brain barrier. So uh, from every direction, is this affecting us physically? Yes. Our health? Yes. Our cognitive ability, our ability to think? Yes. Has certain specific behavioral traits uh, are affected by these metals? So we have one, the human race, if we look back 2,000 years, Stoic philosophy is, a, is some favorite literature of mine, or you, know, you can look at uh, biblical texts, wherever you want to look. We see that there's always been some pretty abysmal human behavior, people who seem to feel they have no part in the common good, no responsibility toward the common good. So we have that to deal with already. You add the rest of this, all these metals, the effect on the neurological system. Now let's add the complete overload of the sensory system with all the things we're exposed to. Again, the iPads, the, the, the TV propaganda that every show, by every commercial you see, by the way, you typically see some spray trails in the background and the, and the asthma commercials and the, the allergy commercials, which is every other commercial we watch. Uh, from every direction, it's... Uh, it's certainly an equation that's adding up to a population that's completely seems incapable of recognizing their heads on fire. But as the shelves on the market become empty, as we begin to hit the wall, and I would argue we are very, very likely very, very close to hit the wall, hitting the wall, people are going to be forced out of that stupor. And that's where our efforts, back to what, Jim, you mentioned earlier, does it feel futile sometimes? Yes, it does at times. But I know that every seed we plant, even for those who are resistant to our efforts to wake them up, that seed's there. And that soil will soon be fertile. Those people will soon be forced to wake. Wait and see. There'll be no hiding for much longer. No, no, I think you're you're absolutely right, and you know uh, that's all we can hope is that uh, you know the people that are eternally to reject us now will uh, will see that perhaps that some that that one dim light or that spark will go off in their brain and they'll go ah you know what I remember Dane saying that or Jim saying that or Jason saying that um, yeah, but you're spot on with that you know backtracking a little bit Dane being here in in uh, in Montana. We every year, and matter of fact, I was talking with my daughter about this just a couple of days ago. Um, it's just, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when we're going to have a forest fire here in Montana. We have one every year typically. Some are much worse than others. Um, but it sounds to me <clears throat> that with the drying out that you're talking about, and then if I remember, if I, if I heard you correctly, I think you said that the trees are being coated with some sort of an accelerant. Um, aren't we going to see, or isn't there a possibility of seeing, you know, forest fires like we've like of biblical proportions here? I mean, if 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 it's dry anyway, and you add accelerant on it, that it sounds like a, that sounds like a recipe for a, a giant forest fire or a bunch of them. What say you, Dane? Uh, it was time to take action. Uh, I got music on my end, guys. I can't hear you. Jason, are you there? Dane, are you still there? I, I, I can I'm hear you. I, I don't know where the music's coming from. Neither do I. I don't know where it's coming from either. I haven't turned anything on. Sleep. Maybe it's a new sleep. ad coming on from the network. Why don't we wait? Okay. In the form of a petition over 50,000 signatures. Then realize there is a way. I don't think we usually have commercials for another minute or so. Decided to start his own care to petition. Just a few simple steps to get the ball rolling. 
Yeah, Jim, do you have any website web pages open? If so, you need to close down those web pages. It's probably an ad that's popped up. The better place. Signatures poured in from around the globe. All right. Let's go. Uh, let's go on break. Uh, uh, we'll be out. We'll be back. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to... Your host. All right, folks, we're back again. I think we had some minor technical difficulties there with the server, but we are back and live. We're here with Dan Quakington of geoengineeringwatch.org. Dan, I wanted to touch base with you a little bit. We well, hold on, hold on, Jason, before you go any further, hold that thought. If we go that. Dane, finish answering that question about the fire before we got cut off, if that'd be okay. I'll make that quick. Um, sure. In, in regard, again, to the incendiary dust, this is the materials being used for climate engineering. Aluminum is an incendiary. It's used in thermite. It's used in demolitions. So, again, the, this incendiary dust does cause the fires to burn hotter, and there's a significant amount of it after it's built up for uh, a long period of time during the summers. And... As far as the, the, the increase in forest fires, we are absolutely seeing that across the board. We see an effort by the authorities to try to downplay that, but it's a fact. Last year, Canada had 600% more forest burn with fire than the historical norm. We're not talking about a little bit more. We're talking about a lot more. In 2013, Siberia lost almost 100 million acres to forest fire Right now, and your listeners can search this online, Siberia is burning right now in regions that are usually frozen solid till mid-June. They're 80 degrees with about 250,000 acres already up in flames right now, about 15,000 people homeless right now from fires burning. Our media does not cover this. The planet, again, though. While, the, while our government and climate engineering back to the psychological operation of keeping the eastern U.S. cool, convincing people that that's the state of the planet, while the rest of the planet is in total meltdown, not just warming, total meltdown, our media is not covering this. South America burning. Tasmania has burnt. Uh, Australia has had its warmest two years on record and burning to the ground. Our media is not covering it. And again... This is not about Al Gore. It's not about carbon credits. It's about reality. So people need to understand um, the planet is in not just warming, it's in meltdown, and climate engineering is making it far worse, not better. And your bottom line question with the forest, Jim, yes, they're going up at astounding rates right now as we speak. Wow. Let's talk a little bit. We had Clifford Carnicom on the other week from the Carnicom Institute, and he's doing a lot of uh, groundbreaking research into Morgellons disease and, and some of these other what appear to be bioengineered um, phenomenon showing up in people's bodies. And there seems to be a, a connection with the geoengineering and, and what they're putting out into the atmosphere. Uh, have you found anything that correlates that? Is that something that you think is a possibility? I do. Clifford's a great guy. I've had the pleasure of meeting him, and uh, I respect his work. I, I believe he his one of his initial films, Aerosol Crimes, I passed out about 3,000 of those films that I purchased from Clifford. He's done a lot of great work, and he's helped bring this issue to light. In regard to more gallons, yes. When the body absorbs fibers, some of the geoengineering patents, primary patent, stratospheric wells box seating for reduction of global warming assigned to Hughes Aircraft in 1991 calls for a polymer fiber in that patent 
to help keep these metals aloft in the atmosphere, to float them like a spider web. When your body absorbs this type of material, it wants to expel that material. Whatever else might be in there, and again, I, I believe Clipper's research, and I believe their biological experimentation is going on. Why in the world wouldn't we believe that? Just what we know is falling on us is, amounts to biological warfare, we have several dozen examples of the U.S. government experimenting uh, on innocent civilian populations. Why wouldn't we believe this is going on? So, yes, I believe Clifford's work is valid. Yes, I believe it's absolutely connected to climate engineering, these, the, the Morgellon situation. What I would argue is that uh, that work is very important, but at the same time, we have to recognize the fact that all of the different health ailments – that the climate engineering is fueling out of control, Alzheimer's, autism, ADD, ALS. And we have agencies like the Alzheimer's Foundation, which publicly denies the connection between aluminum and Alzheimer's. In fact, I tried to support for $500 a booth at the Northern California Alzheimer's Association a fundraising event. They refused my offer of sponsorship because they did not want me talking about any connection between aluminum and Alzheimer's because members of their board are from the aluminum industry. That's I mean, how are you serious? Are you kidding me? I mean, it's, no, I, I just, I, I'm sickened by that. I mean, that just, I mean, Alzheimer's is a killer, man. I mean, it's, it's killing, I mean, it's one of the fastest growing diseases i think on the globe right now and a good reason with all the aluminum in the air i i just sometimes people just astound me dane hey, I apologize for my busting. grandmother my mother probably will get it very soon i think she's already got symptoms of it it's everywhere okay look i'm going to send you guys a link for that particular event because i covered that event i was not about to walk away with that so we showed up. I showed up with a number of activists. Uh, I was threatened with arrest when I got there. They were looking for me. Uh, I invited them to do so because that would bring even more attention to the issue. They backed off. We continued to pass out our flyers to people that were quite astounded at their refusal of my attempt to sponsor. So I'll send you guys the full article that I, I documented that with. But that's how twisted the system is. So, you know, again, we're being... Uh, bombarded with this one out of three seniors in the u.s one out of three now dies with alzheimer's and or dementia and uh, dementia and now i want you to listen to this figure we have now from mit and you guys know who mit is uh massachusetts yes, massachusetts. Massachusetts. yes. yes. Yep. okay mit's latest data states on the current trajectory within 10 years one out of two children will have autism one out yep. of two. Where 50%. are the where are the headlines? And I guarantee you, the one that isn't diagnosed isn't healthy. You can't be healthy because we're all absorbing this. None of us are healthy. None of us are firing on as many neurons as we would have been. And we don't have ten years, by the way, from the biosphere standpoint. We do not have ten years, even if our health wasn't affected. The biosphere is imploding right now, and I, I want to stress this. This is a very non-linear equation. Again, we're in the sixth great mass extinction right now, so from every direction, we can connect so much to climate engineering as the greatest and most immediate threat we face, barring nuclear cataclysm. The climate engineering is the battle we must win, or nothing else matters. Dane, is there any way we can protect ourselves, our bodies? Or specifically, I, I fear for my children. I've got three daughters. I've got a granddaughter. I try to bring them up, you know, t t t teaching them about the truths of the world, you know, preparing them as best I can with hunting and fishing and prepping and everything else. But with, with something as monumental as this and, and just so global, is there anything we can do to help protect our children's bodies, our own bodies? Is there a way we can, can, you know, kind of ride this out and be healthier? Well, first of all, all the prepping in the world, and I, you know, I salute you for that. You obviously care for them, and we all should take certain precautions. But all those precautions will not mean anything if we don't 
deal with this issue if we don't stop it. And all the uh, the health care, the chelation, the attempt to stay healthy won't matter much for long if we don't stop the source. You can and should chelate lots of fresh water. <coughs> you have the blue-green algaes like chlorella is important. You have cilantro is, is good for freeing up heavy metals. Not so good at getting them out of your system, though. Cilantro can tend to just migrate them around. So you can do certain processes like uh, if you have cilantro and then maybe 20 minutes later you have something like zeolite to help escort these materials out of your body. But the bottom line is if you talk to your local nutritionalist, they should be able to put you on a good chelation program in order to keep these metals migrating through your body instead of bioaccumulating there. So that's a really important part. You don't want to go out and exercise if there's heavy spraying going on and you see the air is obviously not clear. This is no joke. These materials are there. You're breathing them. Your children are breathing them. And we're talking about nanoparticulates, by the way. The smaller the particle, the more lethal it is to the human body. It doesn't matter what the material is. And of course, if it's a bad material, it's that much worse. And all of this goes underneath the radar for the air quality testing. This is important for people to understand because people ask, if this is all there, certainly the air quality testing would show it up. Absolute nonsense. The system is designed not to show this material. So at best, air quality testing tests for PM10, 10 microns, or PM2.5, 2.5 microns. We're talking about materials that are astoundingly smaller. Nanoparticulates, you can fit 50,000 across the width of a human hair. We're talking about particles that are inconceivably small. So they penetrate the lung lining, go straight into the bloodstream, and adhere to cell receptors like a plaque. And this stuff is building up in all of us. Every human test subject, we test for hair, blood, urine, packed with these materials, absolutely packed. So yes, you can, you can keep your children more healthy by the proper diet, lots of water, and keeping them out of, uh, you know, how terrible it is if you live in the outdoors out in the middle of the wilderness, and I keep my kids in if it's a very bad day. It's just simply the right decision right now because if, if the right things happen, the spraying could stop tomorrow if, if, if there is systemic collapse. So I wanna keep them healthy as long as I can. But the bottom line is, at the same time we're doing this, we have to focus on this issue. Even if we look at things like Fukushima, which is, again, a horrific accident, no end in sight, could kill us all. But how can we face even issues like Fukushima if we can't think clearly? And I guarantee you, every one of us is, is on a road right now where we are soon not going to be thinking clearly. Guarantee it. There's no question about that. Well, that's a very sobering. Uh, that's a very sobering reality uh, that, that you're that you paint for us, Dane. And um, you know, I, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I mean, I, you know, you, you you realize that you cannot continue to pump these type of things into the atmosphere um, as much as they do. And you know, I, I guess my I guess you know I'm perplexed by the whole thing. Is you know. If they know that it's bad and and they're just trying to do damage control, you know, why don't they just stop? I mean, can, are they are they in the position now where they can't stop? I mean, I, could they stop if they wanted to? Even I mean, what? I mean, I, I guess I, you know, I just I'm perplexed by the whole thing. I mean, you know, you certainly paint it as being a very dire situation, and I believe you're correct. And I guess I just my my my, my normal train of thought. I can't I can't resolve the fact that these people are human beings like us and don't you realize that we all have to live here you know I, I Dane it's just like it's almost like a disconnect from reality brother does a cancer want to kill its host is that its intent to kill yeah its no host? you're right good point it's, not you're right. Intent. its intent is to proliferate with no end that's what a cancer does the host eventually dies and that's what we're faced with so at this point, the fact that the populations are getting sicker and less cognitively functional, that is absolutely seen by the power structure as a benefit because people are less able to think their way out of the box, stand up, and uh, 
stop the insanity. They're, they're, they're less able to do that. So, uh, and, it, and on, the, on the flip side, you have the pharmaceutical mentality, which you know, how many cases do we need of the mainstream medical industry with their pharmaceuticals? You know, take this for that. And by the way, here's, you know, 50 side effects that are far worse. Once you have this machine up and running and everybody has their hand in the pie, it's, it's hard to stop that. There's so many people that have so much invested and think somehow that they're immune to what they're doing. And again, when I say that they think they're immune, psychoanalysis of psychopathic people, various forms of psychosis, there is a common thread. And that common thread is this. Although there's a certain level of genius, there's always a near total lack of of comprehension as to the consequences of their actions, even to themselves. That's a psychopathic person. 4% of society is psychopathic and most of them are in power. So again, there, there are many negative aspects to this equation, but as dire as it looks, and it is dire, I'm, I'm speaking mathematically. It's not my opinion. I'm not speaking from any particular ideology. Our equation is very dark indeed, but that being said, every single person listening could play a profound part in changing the direction of this ship, every single one. The mathematical equation I use often because it's, it points out to people how much power they have. If anybody listening conveyed credible data to two people they know on the beginning of a 30-day month and, and spread this message – and those two to two weeks the next day, and so on for 30 days. After 30 days, the number is five and a half million. And anybody who thinks that math is wrong, I challenge you, do it on your computer. Double the number every day for 30 days, and that's what you end up with. We all have power, but we have to exercise it, not convince ourselves that we can't do anything. We're, we're not helpless. If we're living and breathing and standing, we have a responsibility to the whole. When I walk through my forest, and there's areas where I have I've broken down and cried in areas where there were once hundreds of frogs. And I walked through one day not long ago and I heard one. I heard one single frog croaking and it tore my heart out. But at the same time, it made me furious. But I, all I could think about was, was getting back to my workstation and finding some weak spot in the armor, some, some stone I hadn't turned over. It, that so long as that frog is still there, so long as a tree is standing and a bird is flying and our children are alive and breathing next to us, this is our responsibility, is it not? It is, Dana. I, I, you know, it's amazing. It's exactly where I was just going to go was what, what can we do now? Because I do believe that we are a sleeping giant and that we have the power to change and manifest destiny and I think if we're doing the right things, God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? But we, we need to start somewhere. And I think we're beginning to see that. We're seeing organic uprisings. We saw it with Bundy Ranch. You know, there, there may be another standoff happening in Oregon that I'm going to now. We're seeing people say, we're not going to take this overreach anymore. And once they get educated as to what's, what, what some of these bigger issues are, not just the BLM messing with some miners or some cattle ranchers, but messing with all of us in our air and our planet and, and literally destroying our, the future of our children. I, I think that, that, that giant, those, those genes that are, are within us and may be dormant, but help create this country and help bring about the world that we had is going to awaken and, and there is going to be chance for great change and on that um, note, I, if i could elaborate on that note and, and and i agree with you fully that 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 with which is with us i believe and the, and the forces behind everything that was so perfect before uh man behaved irresponsibly there is immense power there unimaginable power and what do we see in the power of life when we see, again, a blade of grass spring up in the middle of a concrete jungle through the tiniest crack, life will hang on if given any chance. We see a pine tree growing out of a solid stone somewhere. Uh, life is, is unimaginably powerful if we simply allow it to be. 
And climate engineering is, is, is an absolute straight jacket around the planet's life support systems and that we have to, we absolutely have to remove that straight jacket and allow the planet to respond to the damage already done. And if people from their own home, at their own workstation, if they don't allow organizations like the Alzheimer's foundation, again, I'll send you guys the, the, the article I published on this. Please do. If, we, if they don't, if we don't allow them to behave like that, or these agencies that are, that are trying to take water rights and people stand their ground from their own home computer if people send out a flaming arrow of information, and we have that prepared again on the homepage of geoengineeringwatch.org, there's a link called Flaming Arrow, and there's an activist suggestion that's prepackaged with links there, an intro letter, or people can take that link and find a contact for the asthma foundation, Alzheimer's, autism, farm groups, ag groups. Um, the, the list is endless land that credible data in their lap and plead with them to investigate because too many people have no clue this is going on. So the bottom line is that's why the name of the flaming arrow link, launch those flaming arrows, start so many spot fires of awareness that they litter the landscape until they merge into a giant blaze that can't be put out. And that's exactly what we need to do. And if we reach critical mass, our paradigm will overturn the power structure will lose its grip immediately if we reach critical mass on this one issue that has hurt everything living on this planet. We can, we can absolutely overturn this paradigm if we simply focus on what we can do. You know, Dane, I've got one question, one more question for you. We're coming to the end of the broadcast here. Uh, and I brought it up a little bit earlier, uh, but much like your uh, astute observation about the trees – if the bees die off, we die off pretty soon afterwards. Um, do, so do you think Einstein said so? Yeah. Right, right. Do you think that this uh, geoengineering? And I don't expect you to know everything about everything, of course. I just wonder in your in your vast amount of research, have you found out that the geoengineering has anything to do with this this honeybee die off that we're experiencing? It seems like uh, uh, at a record level. It has everything to do with it. It has absolutely everything to do with it. And in fact, this is where academicians are the hardest to reach of all. You can't add to a cup that's already full. And for academicians, they're full of their perceived knowledge. So in the case of the bees, how could it possibly just be a chemical in certain agriculture areas when the bees are just as dead a thousand miles into the wilderness? How could there not be a bigger issue? Of course there's a bigger issue. Between the UV, the bioavailable metals, the toxification of the, or the uh, sterilization of the soils, of course there's a bigger issue. And that issue is geoengineering. Absolutely. There, there's no question about the connection with climate engineering. And again, now you add the radio frequencies, which are also part of climate engineering, and an atmosphere that's much more electrically conductive. It's a virtual onslaught of very destructive forces all coming together and all related to climate engineering. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that if we stop climate engineering, our problems are over. Not at all. We face unimaginable challenges. But again, the single greatest leap we could take in the right direction is to expose and stop climate engineering. And if we don't accomplish that, nothing else will matter. So th that's the long answer to your question. It has everything to do with the bees. And in Northern California, in 10 years, that we've seen the massive ramp up in climate engineering. In 10 years, statistically, in Northern California, 90% decline in aquatic insect life, 90% decline in terrestrial insects. It has everything to do with the spraying. Well, here we go. Uh, Jason, you want to wrap? Yeah, I, again, I just want to say thank you for all the work you're doing, the information you're putting out there. Uh, you're a hero of mine and, and really been instrumental in, in, in helping wake me up to this issue. And uh, I just want to say thank you for what you're doing. And uh, please keep fighting this good fight. We'll try to help however we can. Please, uh, once again, give out your websites, Twitter, anything else that you would like to get out to our audiences. 
geoengineeringwatch.org is our website. Again, we hope we're a resource of information that everyone can use. Another website that's beneficial put out by George Barnes called skyderalert.com, S-K-Y-D-E-R alert.com. People can use as a tool to alert their their legislators as to what's going on. And, and Jason, I appreciate all your support, but I want to say I feel the same about you too. And I'm just like you, sir. I'm a father who wants a life for his children. No more, no less. And we march together in this battle, all of us equally. We're all spokes in this wheel, and it's up to all of us to carry this torch, all of us. So, again, my, my deepest gratitude to both of you as well. Well, uh, Dane, yep. uh, you're, you're a testament to the fact that one man really can make a huge difference. So I hope that uh, not only being an inspiration to myself and Jason, you're an inspiration to our listeners as well because, um, you know, one, one person, and you pointed it out, Really, just one person listening to this broadcast right now could be the one person that makes the difference. If there's got to be somebody. Somebody has to be that one person. Why not? Why not you? You know? Why not you, listener out there? And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. <laughs>